Welcome back. So um, what I'm drawing here is the typical representation of electromagnetic wave with everything that we have been talking about in the last hour. So you know, this is my coordinate system, x, y, z. And I drew them in a perspective view this time so that I can draw magnetic fields in a way that's not out of the board and into the board. So uh, this would be a way to illustrate what we've been talking about. So we said electric field, it's uh, only going to have y component. And it will be a function of x, which means at these different points along x, I can represent the different values of electric field. So if there's a point where I have the strongest electric field, then around that point, there will be a weaker electric field. You have to imagine me representing this in a snapshot form, as in I froze time. This is a moment in time. And at this moment in time, my electric fields look like this. Um, so let me just finish drawing some of them. And so you know what this is, it's a kind of like a vector field, except because there's a, so much information I need to present, I'm choosing to only draw my electric field along the x-axis. So you have to imagine this as a plane wave. There is something that looks like this, slightly offset from x-axis either offset in the y direction or offset in the z direction. It's a plane wave. It fills the entire space that way. So I'm only representing electric field values along one line. Yeah? And what we talked about magnetic field in this situation is that it's going to point along z direction. So that's what this is drawn in kind of a perspective view. So magnetic field, I guess this is not drawn, right? Magnetic field kind of goes this way. And this is perpendicular to the electric field. So if I just draw a few more to fill this up, then this is what magnetic, this perpendicular, and this is what magnetic field looks like. So um, some of the features you see here is that where the electric field is at maximum, magnetic field is actually also at maximum. And they go to zero together, um, and so on. All right, and once again, this is a snapshot view. So if you allow time to flow again, then you will find these two waves propagating to the right. So this is the propagation direction. And um, as I said, um, and I don't know if I can demonstrate. I'll just give this to you as a factoid that your textbook will also repeat, that the electric field cross product with the magnetic field, electric field cross product with the magnetic field, it's a parallel to the propagation direction. It points in the same direction as the direction that the electromagnetic wave is going in. And you can actually prove this using the expressions that we wrote down earlier if you wanted to. And you, what you'll find is that if you want to say wave actually goes this the other way, as in you know your electric field as a function of position and time, it looks like E naught cosine of kx plus omega t instead of minus omega t, then you will find that your magnetic field actually points the other way, so that E cross b points in the minus x direction. This is something that's enforced by Maxwell's equations. So um, let's see, what should I look at? Uh, let me first show you this simulation. This is a simulation of um, radiating charge or simulation of um, how electromagnetic wave is generated. So you know, it's a FET simulation you can find, radiating charge. So what it simulates is simple. Um, so when you have a charge, what does the electric field around it look like? So you know, single stationary charge, you have a radially outgoing charge. I believe the reason it goes out like this is they are trying to illustrate the fact that the effect of electric field, it actually travels in a finite, uh, finite speed. 
if you, you know, created a charge here out of vacuum somehow, then for somebody here to notice that the charge is there, it'll take, you know, the distance divided by speed of light to find that out. So like how, you know, sometimes astronomers say when they see a star going supernova, they say, you know, that star actually went supernova when, you know, I don't know, fishes were walking on land or something. Like, you've heard that, right? Yeah, so that's what they're trying to represent, that it takes time for this effect to, to propagate. So that's that, but once it's done, it sort of looks like a familiar picture you have seen. And I can show you some other more familiar pictures. Oh, no friction. What does that mean? I guess that means if I set it to move, then it'll just uh, keep moving. So you can see that the uh, um, first time I kind of, oh wow, well, I can make it oscillate that way. All right, let me reset it. Um, so let me just do these presets. When it's going in line, linear, then what you see is that um, these field lines don't look all that different. It looks slightly different, which if we are doing special relativity, I would look at how it's different, but we are not. So I'll just say, okay, it looks like it's radially going outward. I'm not gonna worry about that too much. And now what's interesting are, hmm, I don't know what bump does. Oh, I guess that's a bump. All right, not all the interest. What's interesting are sinusoidal and circular. They both result in uh, some kind of wavy thing. And I don't know if I can, let's see. Yeah, I don't think I can really zoom out. Um, so for the plane waves that we've been talking about, this is the wave front that I want you to imagine. Uh, let me just draw a circle that kind of looks like this. So for this oscillating charge here, this is kind of like the wave front. When you see a wave hitting the minimum here, then the minimum hits here also. Um, so you have to imagine as you are far, far away from the charge, this curve will get gentler and gentler. And at some point it'll kind of look more or less flat. And um, the reason I want you to bring up this simulation is to show you one more feature of this, um, how electromagnetic wave is generated that, you know, we won't really do any math in. Um, so I have two parameters that I can control here. Uh, do I want to go back to, let's go back to sinusoidal. Um, oh, and you see that there's no wave propagating up or down, as we are saying. If a charge oscillates this way, there's no wave here. So uh, there's two parameters I can change. I can change the amplitude, so zero amplitude, it's not oscillating, um, and I can change the frequency. And this is what I want you to notice. If I make the amplitude larger, then the size of the wave gets larger, right? That seems reasonable, like the opposite would be, uh, I don't know, opposite would not make any sense. <laughs> like it's, it would be like homeopathy. Um, so all right, so smaller amplitude means a smaller, smaller amplitude of oscillation means a smaller effect of wave here. Now here's one more thing that's uh, interesting to see. Watch me increase the frequency. And when I increase the frequency, I mean frequency of oscillation gets larger, but one other thing gets larger. Let me go back to lower frequency so that you can see. Oops, that's zero frequency, lower frequency. It's probably easier if I draw it. Let me do the larger frequency, and let me draw this uh, line of uh, waves. I don't know why it's getting larger as it gets farther away. I think that's uh, unusual. Um, but you know, let me make the frequency smaller. So what this is simulating is that the amplitude of the electromagnetic wave that's produced, it depends on frequency. If this is oscillating more frequently, it'll actually produce a larger amplitude of wave. Um, this whole thing is covered in some, uh, or if you want one keyword, that would lead into all of this, it's called a dipole radiation. And it is a per division level topic that we won't really talk about any more than this. So this is simulation illustrates those features of electromagnetic wave. And um, before I go into applications of electromagnetic wave, 
Let me just show you one formula that's uh, actually pretty useful and important. And that one formula will be, I mean, useful in the sense of, I don't know in what sense. You're not going to see this on the test. Um, but I think it's useful for you to know that one formula that you should know is something called a pointing vector. And I want you to note, uh, pointing is spelled weird. It sounds like a pointing, as if, if I'm pointing. And it's uh, um, confusing, because the pointing vector, it points in the direction of propagation direction. But it's spelled with a Y. I think it's named after a guy named the pointing. Um, anyways, the pointing vector, let me just bring it up here. Uh, here, maybe that'll get me to the formula page. Um, I haven't really looked where pointing vectors are here. Uh, wait, uh, there it is. So this is the formula for pointing vector. Can I get rid of, I wonder if I can just open this in. Sorry, I haven't used this textbook in, like in this particular format or before. Okay, let me just leave it here. This is the thing called the pointing vector. Um, so th this thing called pointing vector, it, the key important part is the E cross B. That's the part that tells you what direction it's pointing in and what direction the propagation direction is. And the coefficient in front is important too. Once you have the correct coefficient, 1 over mu naught here, then this pointing vector actually so says something specific. It says this. It says, um, so I guess there's a couple different meanings you can assign to this. I'll just uh, say um, uh, two meanings you can assign to it. So uh, I hope I have them memorized correctly. The first meaning you can assign to it is the rate of momentum transfer. I want to say per area. I want to make sure I have correct units before I do that. Um, let's see. It's a It's rate of momentum is that right? Uh, well, per area. And the thing that I was hesitating on was um, if I should say this also per time or something. I, I better figure out the units here. So let me first figure out the units here because that's going to help me. So. Um, this is what I can do. I can actually, so this can be rewritten in several different ways. Uh, let me rewrite it in one way that's um, kind of useful to me. So in both of these rewriting exercises, this is the relationship I'm going to, uh, I'm going to exploit. Uh, I figure out the relationship between electric field magnitude and magnetic field uh, magnitude before, right? So. The magnetic field magnitude was electric field magnitude over C. Or the other way around, electric field magnitude is C times uh, magnetic field. All right? The other information that's going to be useful for me to remember is speed of light C, or rather C squared, is equal to 1 over mu naught epsilon naught. So using that, I can rewrite this in a couple different ways. The first way is going to be actually pretty meaningful. So let me rewrite the electric field amplitude in terms of magnetic field. So in that case, I get this expression. So it's going to be pointing in some vector, pointing in some direction. Let me call it, uh, let me call it lowercase s hat. So some direction. And I'm writing down the magnitude of the vector. It's, uh, these two are perpendicular to each other, so there's no sine or cosine to worry about. 
So C B times B. So this is C times B squared over mu naught. Does this quantity remind you of anything? B squared over mu naught? What do you guys remember about the um, electric um, energy density in electric field and energy density in magnetic field? Right? Uh, that's uh, another useful formula to memorize. Energy density in electric field is one half epsilon naught um, electric field squared. Energy density in magnetic field is one half mu naught magnetic field squared. So what this, uh, so from that alone, what that tells you is that this particular combination must have units of joules per cubic meter energy density. And it turns out that this is actually the energy that is stored in, the, in this particular region due to this electric and magnetic field being there. Half of that is in the magnetic field, and you can actually rewrite that to get the other half that's in the electric field. So, but, so, um, so that's what this expression is. Energy density times speed of light. So there's a speed of light is in the unit of meters per second. Right? So one way I can rewrite these three units, or these units, is uh, meter cancels that out. So it's a joule per second times 1 over meter squared. Right? What's a joules per second? Energy per time? What physical quantity does the energy per time represent? It's in unit of watt representing power. So this is power or watt per square meter. Or this is you know, power per area. And this is a quantity that has a name. Uh, in the case of a radiative power, this is what we call intensity. So when you look at something like a laser beam, it has a high intensity, mainly because it's a certain amount of energy focused down to such a small spot. So you know, high intensity, high power per area. But in terms of the total amount of power output, this projector has much higher power than this laser pointer does. But you know, when you look at any single point, the laser is brighter because it has higher intensity. Good. OK, so, um, so that's what the unit here is telling us. So pointing vector, as it is, it actually represents intensity. So uh, you can just take the pointing vector as it is, and that's actually the second meaning of pointing vector. But pointing vector represents the magnitude of it. It tells you the, it tells you the intensity or power per area. of electromagnetic wave, which is often but not always light, visible light. Right? All right, I still need to figure this out. <laughs> um, so what I wanted to say was the rate of momentum transfer per area. Uh, let me work out the units and see if I need to divide by anything. I don't know why I thought I wouldn't need to, but let's uh, so rate of momentum transfer would be the rate of change of momentum, dp dt per area. So working out that unit, momentum is um, kilogram times meter per second squared per second times one over meter squared. Um, I want to rewrite this in terms of a joule. 
So I am going to multiply top and bottom by a meter. Instead of canceling anything, I will say meter squared, meter third. Then this is joule. So this whole thing is what? What per cubic meter? Oh, I see what it, wait. Per volume? Yeah, so rate of momentum transfer per area doesn't have correct units. Um, so I don't want to say rate of momentum transfer per volume either. So if I want to have correct units, then this would have to be length. Don't know if that makes any sense. Rate of momentum transfer per length. I don't know. This is related to something called momentum flux. And I think I'm pretty mixed up there myself. I'm not sure if I remember. So the, um, the biggest meaning that you assign to pointing vector is the intensity. That's the uh, biggest meaning. That, that one I know is correct. I wanted to say something about momentum because um, this is related to how much force is exerted on a, a charge, uh, exerted on a matter by light. So you might have, um, I'll just show you this as an example of application of um, electromagnetic wave. This is a pretty unusual application, but um, you know, it's an interesting application. So if you Google solar cell, then you will see what that's about. So, it's a, it's a sail that operates by, what? there was a good picture of it somewhere. Uh, let me Google search Icarus. Uh, it, uh, so you know, people have been talking about solar sail for a long time before something um, real actually got launched. This is uh, something real that got launched not that long ago. Um, so, this is a, a solar sail spacecraft. Its main propulsion mechanism is that these are reflective, very light material that's reflecting sunlight. And so, you know, I'm trying to tell you guys that this electromagnetic wave is real, that it has a real physical meaning, physical quantity. And there are two senses in which this electromagnetic wave is real. One, it carries energy. That's what's represented here. And two, it carries momentum uh, in whatever combination that's actually correct. But <laughs> key thing is that it ca actually carries momentum. So as this light is either absorbed or is reflected back, there is a change of momentum. So this must be absorbing that momentum. So there's a force on this to move forward. So uh, that's the idea that solar cell is based on. And um, this got launched in like 2012 or something. And you know, it, it actually works. Uh, it's a proof of concept that solar cell, whether it's practical or not for actual space travel, that it actually works. That by reflecting sunlight, you can uh, propel a spacecraft. 